Good afternoon. Welcome to the tutorial video number eight. Today, we will talk about causes of prosperity. So, we know that there are three factors that they will make a nation prosper. What are those? First of all, to accumulate more physical capital. Second, to invest in human capital. And third, to research and develop technology. If you are able to do those three things, you know that you are going to be prosper. If we know that, why not all countries, don't they just follow this simple recipe? And all countries, they would be developed as the top countries are nowadays. So why is it the whole world not as developed as the most developed countries? There are five different factors that they help prosperity above and beyond those three fundamental factors here. Let's see them one by one. First of all, climate and ecology. Growth is affected by climatic and ecological conditions, which largely are outside of the nation's control. Like, for example, in hospitable area for agriculture, or the reverse, hospitable conditions for disease. We can see that those two are the major reasons why an entire continent, Africa, was left behind in the race of growth of GDP that occurred in the planet the latest century. So, for example, when the population started growing, it didn't help that most of the land in Africa was actually desert. Also, two out of five important pandemics for the last 30 years they did start in Africa. Even today, in some African countries, the percentage of carriers of the virus HIV that causes AIDS is one out of four individuals. If nothing else, this is not really going to help the country to prosper. Daytime temperatures may prohibit intense labor in some countries. For example, the difference of development in the southern United States and in the northern United States, till the 1970s that air conditioning was invented, was vastly different. Most serious industrialization happened in the north, while in the south, you could have only agriculture. After the air conditioning was invented, this actually gradually changed, and now the situation has balanced. But this doesn't mean that the northern states didn't start ahead of the South in this particular case. Even in Europe, you will see actually situations that they come from that. Like for example, even today in Greece, because in the summer, the temperatures are very high, 39, 38, sometimes above 40 degrees, you will see that the stores and some companies, they close during the midday, so they will avoid the high temperatures. This is not a very good environment for business, in other words. So such conditions, they do make it harder for those countries to accumulate wealth and to be able to invest this wealth so they will grow. So even if you have the production factors to begin with, it will be very difficult to use them. The second factor is geography. Growth is also affected by geographical or geopolitical conditions, which are also outside of the control of the nation. Like, for example, navigable rivers for transportation or access to the sea. From the previous century, we can see that most major cities, they will be built in areas that they had one of the two. They were either next to a big body of water, like a sea or a very big lake that had the rivers that would lead in the end in the sea. Uh, but navigable rivers were very important because they could help trade. They could help uh, to find ways to be able to feed the population of bigger cities. If you see the geography of Egypt, you will actually realize that the entire country is almost deserted except around the Nile River. And this is because the river was an opportunity for agriculture, for communication, and also for transportation, which was very important. The existence of natural resources was extremely important. You can see, for example, that the fate of Saudi Arabia or Qatar or Kuwait or even Iran and Iraq is vastly different 
than the fate of Yemen or even Afghanistan because only of the existence of natural resources. I mean, if you have oil, it doesn't solve all your problems, but it makes the situation much better for you. At least it's a good that everybody wants to buy from you and this will give you the opportunity to be able to acquire capital that some other countries without natural resources, they will not have the ability to acquire. Suitability of the terrain for building infrastructure. This is also very important. You can see in the United States, if you want to build a highway, you just put some cement on the ground and there you have a highway because it's almost everywhere totally flat. If you want to make a highway in Northern Italy, you have to dig under the mountains, build bridges from one mountain to the other. That will cause the amount of money that you need to invest to be much higher in order to build the same thing. Another very important factor is the possible cooperation with neighboring countries. Because it's very different to be Switzerland where all your neighbors, they actually want to help you and they just want to come to you to deposit their money and you, you don't even have an army in your borders because you're not threatened by any of your neighbors, which are countries with very high GDP that nobody actually wants to take your land. And it's a very different story if you are Israel that for good or bad reasons, that's not what we examine here, uh, everybody around you just uh, go to bed at night and wake up in the morning with one dream in mind just to throw as many missiles as possible to your own country. So it will not be as easy for Israel to prosper as it is for Switzerland, for example. The third factor is culture. Some societies may have values that they encourage investment, hard work, and the adoption of new technologies, while others may nurture the superstition and suspicion of new technologies, and they would discourage hard work. Growth is affected by cultural elements. This is undoubtable. Now, how this happens and which are the cultures that they encourage growth and which are the cultures that they do not encourage growth it's a little bit controversial. However, we can say that shaped past experiences, like for example, wars, uh, hardship of the past, if you went through an occupation period, this may make the country to, to actually have a, uh, a personality, a national personality that will help them to prosper. They will see it as, okay, so we did well after this war, we all fought together, so now we have to do the best for the nation anyway. National attitude towards the public property is different from country to country. An example for that is the tax evasion culture. Like, for example, in many countries, uh, if you tax evade, it gives you bragging rights. It's something that you are going to discuss with your friends as uh, bragging that you did something good. You know, I was able to not give my money to the evil system. That's how they see uh, the government. In other countries, however, you will see that even if you tax evade, you are not going to say it to anybody because you feel ashamed for doing it. It's good that you saved some money, but you don't want to say it around because people, the first thing that they will think is that, oh, this guy actually is not paying now for schools, is not paying for uh, uh, building streets, is not uh, paying for infrastructure, is not paying for public health, so I have to pay more. So different nations, they see it differently. In the first kind of nations, people will be like, my friend, congratulations that they, you didn't pay the evil country. In the other uh, uh, countries, the other nations, people will be like, shame on you that you don't pay your taxes. Strength of family ties can help nations out of difficult situations. Uh, like, uh, for example, what happened in Greece is an example of that, that after uh, long unemployment periods, people that they were 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 years old, they were able to uh, leave their homes and just go back and live with their parents. And this was something that could be tolerated from the culture. But in other cultures, this would not happen. Like, for example, there are other nations that after you become 18, then you need to buy uh, dessert or flowers if you want to visit your parents' house. So this is something that may actually help different nations out of different situations. 
religious teachings, another controversial issue. Uh, some religions, they encourage hard work, they encourage investment, they encourage the adoption of new technologies. Other religions, they are very hostile to that. So this is something that is not easy to have an example. Uh, you know that I always want to have an example for something, but it's not the best thing to come here and tell you that, you know, this religion is good for prosperity and this religion is bad for prosperity. So in order to avoid this, I will do the smart thing. I will follow your textbook and your textbook does the smart thing also. They just uh, say what Max Weber said. Max Weber was the father of sociology as a science, let's say. So he said that uh, Protestantism was the main cause of industrialization of the West. So he said that the principles of Protestantism was what played a key role in helping the West to industrialize. Um, I can extend this example and say something that, from my experience, nobody will be uh, offended. And this is, uh, let's say, the Amish culture. The Amish culture is a culture that they don't believe in technology. They actually uh, say that technology is bad for you. And we see that prosperity, as far as GDP is concerned, is pretty low in the Amish society just because their own beliefs, they prevent them from using the capital as effective as other beliefs. And finally, the strength of national identity, like, for example, a strong preference towards local products against imported products, which allows the local products to have a stronger brand name in the end, or the support of policies. One policy like that could be a good example, what Singapore was doing after the COVID-19 crisis that caused unemployment because of the closures, uh, they actually had an official policy that prioritized locals from being hired than foreigners. This actually is something that will help the local population and will allow the country to get out of the crisis a little better. And when later there is a need for foreign workers, then the government will open the possibilities for the, for the companies to be able to hire people from abroad. The fourth factor is institutions. Institutions are the formal and informal rules that they govern the organization of a society. And they can be rules, practices, laws, regulations. So anything that can be a constraint and is humanly devised will affect the economic incentives in this society and therefore will affect prosperity. So institutions will affect the economic incentives in the society depending on the willingness to do some important things. First of all, to protect rights and to eliminate corruption. It's very important to protect the right of property and the right of life. Back in the 90s, in the, when the Soviet Union fell and became uh, independent, different independent countries, then in Russia, a very usual thing was that if you were operating a very successful business or you had a nice factory, the mafia will come to you and they will ask you to give them the keys and sign the title to them just like that or else they would kill you. And there was no institution that will protect either your life or your property, which was something very bad. We also see in every different project and research that we do on corruption, that there is a very strong negative correlation between corruption and GDP. If corruption is high, GDP will be low, and the reverse, to promote social justice and mobility. If I know that by working hard and by investing in my human capital, I will succeed, then this means that I will work hard because I have the incentive to work hard. This in two words, you can just call it the American dream. This is where the American economy was uh, based and it was booming in the previous century. If you know that by working hard, the social justice and the social mobility will allow you to become better, to prosper, no matter what is your family, no matter where you started from, 
If you work hard and you are smart, you will succeed. This gives you an incentive to try. Otherwise, if you know that no matter what you do, if you are not coming from a wealthy family, you are having no future, then this means that nobody will want to try there. Third, to encourage investment in capital and R&D. The government can have policies and institutions that they will make it easier for you to invest in new capital and in technology to ensure a steady economic environment. Economy does better when there is a calm economic environment. This is because everybody likes stability. If you have very high inflation and nobody cares to lower the inflation, or if you regulate one thing now, and then when people follow it, follow what you wanted to encourage with regulation, after a couple of years when they sank some costs there, you go and you tax them, then at some point they will stop trusting you. So they need a stable economic environment. If they have a consistent economic environment, then the economy can prosper. Number five, history and also luck. Like for example, nations often tend to follow the footsteps of their ancestors. Why? Because this is the path of least resistance. If you grow up looking at your father doing something or your mother doing something, it's very easy for you to do the same and it's very likely also to have the same talents. Okay, so you do that just not because you think that this is the future, just because you think that this is easier for you to do. You have to do something. Why not doing this that is easier for you? Countries therefore develop traditions in something. Like for example, the Italians were very good in making shoes and the Germans were very good in engineering things. Americans were very good in doing services. And then the Swiss people, they were very good in banking. Now, if what you developed a tradition in later happened to become either trendy or to become really hot after some point, then you would be a winner after that. Like, for example, what happened with the Greek island Santorini? Santorini is this place, is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And in every ranking tourist um, related, it comes up to the top three, like top three most romantic places, top three best service places, top three uh, beauty of sunset, as if sunset is different in every country, I don't know. So Santorini, just recently, the last 30 years, happened to be above the average GDP of the rest of Greece. As I told you before, Greece is a very sparse country and very fragmented. So different places, they have totally different personality. Like you have two islands that they are maybe 50 miles from each other and they have developed very different personalities, very different local cultures, just because they have the sea between them and communication is not very easy. So Santorini is a volcanic island, it's built on a volcano. And as you understand for the first 2000 years of the Greek civilization, this was not a very smart idea. Like it's not the smartest thing to say, ha, huh, where should I build a house? Do you know what? There's a mountain there that sometimes it erupts and hot lava comes out and destroys and kills everything around. That's where I want my house to be. So people would not really prefer to live there. There was pretty much nothing in the island. There are a few agricultural products, like for example, a special variety of grapes that you can have there and you can make wine. Uh, Santorini wine is very famous and expensive because it's very little. There is no uh, a lot of space on the mountain for doing agriculture. So until the 1980s, this was a very poor island, one of the poorest islands in Greece. It was very pretty, but back in the, uh, in the 70s and the 60s, nobody would understand that, you know, one day somebody will travel 3,000 or 4,000 or even 12,000 miles just to come here and see the sunset. So people could not really believe that. So if you stayed in Santorini back then, you stayed because that's where you could live. That's where you knew where, that's where your home was. However, after some point, if you had the little winery there, the land of the winery might be worth millions of euros. And this didn't happen because you were smart. It happened just because you stayed there, 
since you didn't have a home anywhere else and you could not move anywhere else. Also, not unusually, the winners of wars and conflicts, which happen sometimes due to mere lack and nothing else, are the ones who take advantage of the losers. One of the most important examples for that is the Second World War. That was one of the, of the most crucial points in history ever. Humanity as we know it today would be super different if the Germans had won the war. If the Nazis had won the war, the history would be written in a very different way. The most crucial part of the Second World War, the last opportunity for the Germans to turn the situation around, was in 1944 in the Battle of the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge, as it is known, where Due to just a lucky event, Germans were defeated, and this actually was decisive for the end of the war. What happened was that the Germans thought that the best strategy is to attack the Americans that they had camped in, an, uh, in a forest, in uh, the forest of Ardennes, in Belgium, in the northern Belgium. So they planned the attack, and they, uh, it was almost sure that they are going to win over the Americans, and then it was almost sure that if the Americans suffered a very big loss, they would actually leave the war, would be a very important event for the rest of the war. Without the Americans, perhaps the Allies would not be able to win this war. So what happened was that they attacked, and then they had surrounded the Americans, and the Americans could not resupply themselves because normally during that period of the year, there is an overcast in this area and no airplanes back then could fly and throw uh, supplies that the Americans needed. So it was a matter of days that the Germans would actually attack. What happened in the end was out of a miracle, something that was not happening very usual and a very unusual event, that one day the sun came up and it was a really beautiful day. So the Allies took advantage of that, they resupplied them, they were able to counterattack, throw away the Germans, and then they were able to save the war this way. This was just a matter of weather of a particular day, what actually make the war to lean that way and not the other way. A totally random effect. So. Yes, there are many factors that they are in your control, but there are many other factors that they are not in your control, like history and luck.